we have a uh, very strong panel uh, joining us today. Uh, from Zin, we've got Mohammed El Alim, who works as an advisor for the National Healthcare Institute, the Dutch HTA agency. Um, his work involves the assessment of HTA submissions, as well as more methodological um, projects, such as the update of the Dutch gu guideline for economic evaluations. Um, we also have Baris Denise from uh, GlaxoSmithKline. Uh, he's an executive director there, uh, HUR and market access with years of experience. Um, Baris work focuses on HUR's strategic role in connecting approval to patient access and evidence generation to articulate value of interventions. And his recent focus has been on exploring and experimenting with new technologies in the HUR domain, um, including R. We also have uh, Jean-Étienne Barre from uh, HUR modeling at Arexel, um, which is among the world's largest um, CROs. Uh, he works in access and HUR modeling and delivering global and local health economics models for research and submission purposes. Um, he holds a PhD in biomedical sciences and an MBA. And his entire non-academic career has been in HUR modeling in big pharma companies and several large CROs. His interests are in how tools and techniques can bring patients more transparency, reproducibility, and value. And last but not least, we have Marina Richardson, um, an Associate Director of HTA Methods and Health Economics at ICER, uh, which is, um, to those who do, don't know, it's an um, increasingly important HTA agency in uh, the US, attempting somewhat to become the US ICER, so or the US NICE, so it'll be very important to get our somehow involved at ICER. Uh, Marina's role is to lead and contribute to HTA methods and health economics that support health system uh, decision making nationally and internationally. Uh, before joining ICER, uh, Marina spent seven years at Canada's drug agency, and um, she is also a member of the editorial board at the International Journal of Technology Assessment in Healthcare. Now, our the topic of our discussion is um, experiences and approaches to building capacity in these various organizations, which come from regulators, uh, consultancy and um, industry and we want to know what is their view of R by your organization um, how have you, how have your efforts been viewed by colleagues and seniors what are the barriers you've experienced and what worked well not so well um, using these we try to draw lessons for other organizations that want to help build capacity or help make this transition to R. Um, prior to having the panelists speak I thought I would give a quick survey of existing courses and materials um, to show what where you can go for information on learning R and help to build capacities in your organizations. Uh, one of these is the economic evaluation and modeling short course at Bristol Medical School, uh, which will be running actually in just a couple of weeks. This uh, includes markup modeling, semi-markup models, VOI, and this has been incorporated into the one-year MSc in health economics and health policy analysis, also at Bristol. Um, another farther afield option would be to go to Florence, which runs a summer school between the 22nd and 26th of July. Um, this is organized by most of the UK academics, uh, but who decamp to Florence for a week to focus on all sorts of aspects of HTA, not just modeling. Uh, as we all know, Dark Peaks uh, run um, an excellent course on making health economic models shiny. Uh, which includes state transition models and building user interface for health economic model. Uh, the DARTH group in Canada, which is somewhat RHDA's counterpart in Canada, runs a huge variety of different courses, um, including the three that I've highlighted here on R for decision modeling in HDA, which is a five-day workshop, um, an advanced decision modeling using R, where you bring your own model workshop, which is quite an engaging or interactive sessions. And there's also our uh, favorite international so society for health economics, um, ISPOR, uh, they run uh, various online courses, so including learning and applying discrete event simulation, run by Kuhn Degeling, um, which is uh, run in R. There's also the in-person short courses at the European conferences, both on introduction to R and more applied cost effectiveness modeling by with R. And these will likely run again in 2024 or 2025. And in addition to all these courses, there are many tutorials now being published um, by members of DARTH, people from Dark Peaks Analytics, um, from Lumanity, and many of our RHTA um, committee members. Okay, so without further ado, I will pass over to our first uh, panelist, uh, Mohammed El Ali from Zin. So, Mohammed, would you like to share your screen? Yes, I will. And I'll, I'll notify you when we get to the, the five minute mark. Would you tell me whether you can see my slides? We can see them. Perfect. Well, um... So during this uh, this short presentation, I'll give you an idea of how we uh, uh, we try to build capacity in 
for HTA agencies, specifically for the Dutch HTA agency, in using R. Um, some of the slides might uh, look a bit familiar since I've recycled them. So some of you might have seen them uh, in the morning a little bit. And one of the first ones that you already have seen in the morning was this one. And I don't necessarily have to repeat all of this. And I think multiple uh, presenters today have mentioned the drawbacks of Excel and the potential of using R. So I'll just skip over this and, and go through uh, to the steps we've taken not only to make sure that we could use R within the organization, but also on how to build capacity. Um, so we've spoken to international consorts such as r hta this one, and DAR. Um, we also received a specified training for us by the DARTH group. So as uh, Howard just mentioned, there is a course at the Erasmus MC uh, at the NIHES uh, school that is offered every year by people from, uh, from DARTH. We were thinking about doing that course, but unfortunately a five day week is a little bit too long considering the timelines and considering the, the pressure on, on the assessors we have. So we've asked for an in-house in training by, uh, by people from DARTH with a focus on uh, the assessment of, uh, of models rather than being able to build models uh, ourselves. Furthermore, we linked with other HCA organizations that I briefly mentioned this morning as well. Uh, think about TLV from Sweden, CADET from Canada, uh, NICE as well. And we discuss various options. We also share with each other experiences. How do you train for using Excel, uh, for using R and so on and so forth. And we published a guideline as you already might uh, have seen a couple of times today. And that was actually to reach some sort of standardization. And this, in, in this guideline, we specified some, some requirements on how to uh, structure your folder, uh, where to put all the files, how to report your model, but also what packages could be used. And as presented this morning, uh, we performed a pilot to learn a little bit more on how to use uh, models in R. Um, not only to learn how to use these models, but also to make sure that our guidance is, 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 is able to be used in practice. And one of the most important parts is that we've worked on our IT infrastructure um, to allow uh, safe use of R, which has proven to be quite a struggle. But there are still a number of steps remaining to take. So we have a number of, of staff members that do have experiences, experience with R, uh, of our pharmacoeconomic assessors, let's say three to four people have experience with R, either from a previous position or in the education uh, and so on and so forth. Um, but we do need some more courses and education specifically targeted at the assessment. We are also open to be to, to, to go to courses, obviously, or ask for, for parties to give us in-house courses um, to build models ourselves, because that could help as well in understanding how a model is, uh, is built and how a model could be assessed. And hopefully in the future, we would also receive more models in R. This morning, we talked about the pilot we've done with BMS. And BMS was actually the only party that, that showed, well, there were a number of parties that showed interest, but eventually only uh, BMS actually went through and really submitted a, a, a dossier to us that we could learn from. What we also have done or we're planning to do is that we are going to use the mock model that we got from uh, the, the factor BMS. And we are going, at least for me and some other colleagues, we're going to share this model with other colleagues uh, within our team and show them how this model can be run, how you can adapt it and, and how it works and so on and so forth to make sure that, uh, that R can be used. Furthermore, these are also points that we briefly touched upon this morning. I mean, various people actually already touched upon these points, which is that we need support from the organization, especially from the upper layers, that they see the added value, that they see that they need to invest um, uh, in making this, this IT infrastructure possible and, and invest in vendors to being able to make these, um, these environments for us. And that's the, the second point. We've received various versions that were unworkable for us. We got one of the first versions of R without anything, no freedom whatsoever. And we were 
we weren't even able to install packages. So we told them we can't, we can't even do anything with this. It's just a calculator, in a sense. So we couldn't do uh, anything with it. Uh, if we look at the, the packages that are available nowadays for, for health economic development. And as I briefly mentioned this morning, um, I'm ashamed to say this, but this, this took quite a long time before we even got a working version of R within our environment. Understandable from one point of view, but it, in my opinion, um, uh, maybe the management was not convinced of the the, the, ur the, the urgency or the, ad the, the, the real added value of, uh, of these type of cyclical uh, software. And furthermore, the willingness of pharmaceutical companies to submit models in R is, is really, really important. That brings us, that brings me to the last, the last slide for, uh, for now. Um, standardization is kind of key, especially from an assessment efficiency point of view. We have very short uh, timelines, uh, especially in lens, we have three months to do a full assessment, including going through the model. So having some sort of standardization helps and collaboration and alignment between various HCA organizations is also key in, in, in combination with the willingness of pharmaceutical companies to submit models in R. And last, academic consortia are very important. If they do the creative, innovative work. They have time to do this innov innovative, to, 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 to give us these bright ideas. But it is also important that these, these, these tutorials and these papers would also be something that we could use in practice. And that's something that would be very nice to have kind of some direct links between academia and HC agencies, but maybe also with pharmaceutical companies. Thank you very much, Howard. Thanks very much, Mohammed. Um, I'll we'll hold questions till the discussion in a moment. Um, but our next speaker is Baris Denis. Would you like to share your slides? Sure. And we can see, can them. You see them. Yeah. Thank you. Perfect. So thank you, Howard. Um, I will cover this fairly quickly, so we have more of a conversation at the end. Uh, as a starting point, a uh, quick disclaimer: uh, the opinions that I'm going to share here are mine, not of my employer. And today, I would like to talk about our experience from a recent effort to transition towards R in uh, health economic model development uh, from Excel, which has been the uh, primary tool that we've been using for many, many years. Drivers for that push were several faults. One was uh, internally our timelines, and I think this is true for most of the colleagues on the line as well. Our timelines were getting shorter and shorter. The, uh, from question uh, set up to insight generation, the time that we had was diminishing as we were pushing for faster uh, development uh, cycles on the uh, clinical development side, as well as preparation for market access. And handling some of these type timelines with a tool like Excel uh, has been getting quite challenging uh, because of the process that we, need to, we needed to take uh, to develop models and generate insights. Another factor for this drive uh, was uh, better integration with the rest of the evidence that uh, we were collecting, synthesizing, uh, and then finally plugging into the models. Doing some of these things in other software packages are being one of them for MTC, NMAs and ITCs and uh, survival analyses, and then bringing back to Excel, not only extends the uh, duration of the process, but it also uh, introduces more points for uh, errors and mistakes as we uh, carry the information from one platform to another. And then there's also uh, organizational push for R. I think this is also a common theme across uh, industry. Uh, in the past, uh, SAS or other soft statistical software packages were the preferred methods uh, on the R&D side, clinical development side. Now there's a move towards R because of the flexibility that it brings and the packages and the open source nature of it. Uh, so we were basically riding that wave uh, that the organization was on as we were thinking about R for health economic models. And then lastly, uh, I guess 20 years ago, Excel was a perfect fit for the needs in the health economic domain when we were really doing either decision trees or very, very simple Markov models. Nowadays, most of the models have so much other components and complexity. We have multiple different survival uh, functions, distributions. Uh, we have many, many subgroups, many, many treatment arms. 
uh, there is time dependency in the models we built, which creates these tunnel states and everything else. But the complexity that we deal with on a regular basis today, I don't think is appropriate for Excel. And we were trying to figure out how to, again, address those needs without necessarily increasing the timelines or the uh, effort on our part as we were trying to answer questions. On the challenges side, uh, obviously, like any other organization, uh, we needed to upskill our group so that we were comfortable and competent with our. That required time commitment. And I think Mohamed made the comment about uh, some of these courses being five days uh, at a different location. Uh, how we basically fit this learning into our day jobs into that schedule was another challenge that we needed to address. That is why we uh, designed a bespoke training that span over almost a year, uh, not necessarily every day, every week, but we had the time to go over the content, uh, practice on it, come back for questions and so forth, but it was really a learning uh, curve uh, on our own pace. Uh, the other part was convincing the internal stakeholders uh, that we needed this upskilling, these resources uh, to be able to meet the needs, internal needs. Uh, most of the internal stakeholders in the industry side are really interested in the outcome rather than the tools or the processes that we use to get to those outcomes. So how do we bridge that uh, uh, gap between what they need versus what we need to get to uh, those uh, insights was another area that we work, uh, I would say quite a bit so that we, we were able to secure the resources. And then lastly, even after all these changes, old habits are hard to change. There's always this inclination to go back to original methods or the, the Excel or what have you uh, to do the modeling. But how we, uh, uh, one of the challenges we needed to overcome was bringing art into our workflows and use it consistently so that these knowledge can actually be polished and becomes almost a second nature when we jump onto these projects. Uh, some additional thoughts about this experience. Uh, one of the things I think I'm seeing more and more is there is a generational barrier to R, particularly the industry. Most of the budget holders in the industry are the ones or the generation that grew up with Excel as we did cost effectiveness models and such. Now they're not necessarily in the process of developing these models, but their understanding of R is quite limited. Hence their primary go-to place becomes Excel and what, whatever they're uh, uh, comfortable with. So there is some tension between the new generation of health economists who are focusing on modeling and uh, the budget holders, decision makers, who are more familiar with uh, Microsoft Excel. As I mentioned, as a second point, internal stakeholder holders are less interested in the tool and the processes, but more interested in the outcome. Uh, so there is an education that needs to take place and probably delivered by us to explain why this tool is not only a tool, but also facilitates and addresses some of the bottlenecks that we face with other platforms like Excel today. Uh, and then the third one is, Mohamed also mentioned to this, the way that I see uh, this uh, transition happening is there's a demand hierarchy. Uh, usually industry is reactive to what HTA preferences are and what they ask for. And industry then drives the consultancies in terms of what they would like to work or how they would like to deliver certain projects. So unless we uh, see a stronger push, which by the way, I think there has been a movement in the last five years or so towards our, uh, uh, from HDA agencies, but unless we see more uh, uh, push and stronger pull from HDA agencies, I don't think we'll, there will be a, a quick uptake of R as a preferred platform for health economic modeling. So there's some, I think, work to be done there. And then lastly, as we were going to our training, uh, again, there's so many different resources as Howard explained. One of the things that we realized, uh, either those publicly available resources are quite uh, uh, introductory level, really setting up uh, high level models and so forth, uh, or we immediately jump into this uh, packages that can handle more complex functions and operations, but less transparent for especially beginner level uh, users. So I think there's a gap between uh, uh, those two uh, ends where we can create models that are more applicable to our day-to-day -day work that includes, uh, I don't know, multiple treatment lines, discontinuations and other aspects, 
uh, instead of just uh, showing how the model can be set up and run in a very simple way or going to extreme where you can do Bayesian cost-effectiveness analysis by putting a bunch of inputs and then leaving the rest of the computations to a package and get, get the results out. I'm not arguing that neither of these things are uh, wrong. I'm just saying, I think if you wanna get people to get trained, use some materials and actually develop some models that are real world can answer uh, questions that they have, there may be a second step between the first and third uh, to, to make that move. And then lastly, uh, I, I think the first point is quite bold, but I, again, given the co uh, complexities that we are dealing with, uh, transition to something else other than Excel is almost inevitable. And obviously our seems to be a very uh, natural choice there. Uh, the shift towards R, I think will uh, uh, increase uh, by the position and preference of uh, HDA agencies, I believe. Uh, to reduce the steepness of this learning curve, I think, again, we would like to have the second step between what we have today in terms of uh, beginner type of tutorials and, and uh, some of the more complex packages that has less uh, transparency to them. And then lastly, it is on us really to articulate the value of R because uh, I think our fields are quite reactive to uh, uh, other other factors. We need to be able to explain the value that art brings, not on the technical terms, but from the business needs perspective, so that we can get more support as we get to uh, uh, secure the resources we need to move on that journey. And with that, I will I will pause. Thank you very much, Barish. Mm -hmm. um, Jeff, would you like to share your slides? Yeah, sure. So continuing on building capacity in R from the consulting perspective, um, as I mentioned this morning, we are in a, there is a disclaimer, but we can pass over. Uh, there is an exciting intersection in, in consulting where we see many clients having different things and we have probably a more flexible IT environment than in, in some clients and we can learn and, and share uh, experience on, on that. Um, we have experienced several different HTA perspective and, and how they approach uh, the implementation of R in this case, but also how they approach the implementation of cost effectiveness model or budget impact model in their different reimbursement. Um, this leaves, as Barish mentioned, uh, kind of indirectly little time to do cool stuff and out of the box blue sky uh, research, but still there are things that, that we are doing. In, general HR, HUR consulting, uh, we have a variable need for experience in R uh, from approximately zero to 25% of modeling projects are uh, in R either because it makes sense, confer dynamic modeling or agent-based modeling as it was mentioned before. I still would like to see an effective uh, agent-based model in, in, uh, in Excel. Um, or, as Barish mentioned directly, because it is requested by our client. I have so far never encountered a project where when we look at past submission in HTA, uh, we decide or we suggest to choose R because past submissions were submitted in, in R. Um, as it was mentioned in the chat uh, this morning, most of the interactive layers that we do are now in R also for our model are shiny, and it's especially the case for model dashboard, early cost effectiveness model, or model overlay for a non-modeler audience. So we have some facilities and difficulties in hiring and recruiting talented R modelers. In terms of facility, we have a quite flexible IT partner in general for quick integration of new R version, new tools, new server environments. We can exchange very quickly because of the size of the company, the stat and biostat team is very often in the same structure or very close. And we can also hire for a modeling group, we could hire our programmer instead of HUR modeler or HUR manager. Of course, these are generalities. Some companies can do very well that and some consulting can have some difficulties in these aspects. The difficulty I saw in the recruitment and to expand a bit the talk this morning is that young modelers are often exposed to R in their curriculum, but this exposure varies from basics to basic to some experience, but usually in statistics in the base R package, for instance, and plus ggplot if, if needed. 
when we hire experienced uh, programmers, then we may have the opposite, the lack of health economics and modeling background. And so the, the, the mix, the, the two are somewhat difficult to find compared to uh, Excel uh, health economics modelers. Um, another difficulty is that currently most experienced modelers in the general consulting market are proficient in Excel and less, if at all, in R. And this is an issue for mentoring younger talents, younger modelers. Um, and it was also mentioned this morning, the turnover and the projects, therefore the project sustainability is one of the difficulty. So building on these challenges and facilities, we, in, in most of the uh, consulting firms I went to, I worked for, or I saw, we are building two big venue of solutions that are not perfect and that are not complete. The first one is to build a rigorous R programming environment. This is inspired or shared from biostat and clinical trial analysis. Uh, it's highly regulated. Uh, they need reproducibility, openness, and sharing with the regulator. So it's very interesting to get that upfront and bootstrap our own development. We are also in pharma as general, um, highly regulated by regulatory guidelines, standard operating procedures. Um, and so we are bound to that also. Um, and we can try to build for some flexibility in the implementation rather than trying to build all these guidelines, all these uh, standard procedures from scratch. Now, practically, um, we are building on a standardized environment with a common R profile for all of us. And then we update, of course. Uh, it's based on R Studio. This is not a big surprise. Uh, we have a style guide that is a mix of Google's and Tidyverse with enforcement via several packages. Um, and so but with that, we try to build a more accessible, more readable, shareable, and easy to verify code. Um, we have four levels of uh, validation of a package repository and four, three, five, depending on the different consulting companies. Laying from zero is, well, you get a package from somewhere, CRAN or GitHub, and you can try it in your own sandbox. But as soon as you try and uh, approach the submission, then you have to climb the uh, layers and go to the first one, which is a reviewed package that is somewhat, somehow assessed either by the HTA agencies or at least uh, recommended by the HTA agency or internally or uh, via an external third party. Um, and finally, we, as a good programming uh, practice, we have a company-wide version control server. So that's the tools. Uh, now, what about the people? And for that, we I've seen several companies trying to build an R curriculum between- and Jeff, the just a little spare one minute. Yeah, sure. Finishing. The challenges are time availability, the capacity, um, the comfort, the mentorship example before, and the importance also of not just R, but the R tools and environment. And the solution are various. So I mentioned the Perl growing learning method uh, that we use at Parexcel. We also bootstrap with external support. So in person, virtual, we now have also a private large language model that can help us build our R code. And we can also build some kind of autonomous interactive learning path, but this is nowhere near a real course that we are not trying to do because this is not our job, basically. So last slide, how can we build a better capacity? Many things have already been said. My take here is to improve the theoretical, the programming bit uh, with all the tools supporting and the practical hands-on in HOR specifically, and also the sharing, the best programming practices, the success, where it helped deliver um, models, awareness, and of course the pitfalls in order to avoid them in the future. Um, and we also would like to encourage and suggest R to clients when it's appropriate from a modeling perspective. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Jeff. Uh, Marina, would you like to share your slides? Okay, uh, so hopefully you can see those okay. Okay, perfect. Okay. Uh, so let's see. So first disclaimer here, um, 
is that ICER actually uses MSXL for all of our uh, economic models. So I think we're a bit early, earlier in the thinking than, than the other organizations that have spoken so far. Um, and just to note that, yes, these are my views uh, and not the views of, of my organization. I think also importantly to note is that ICER is different from other HDA organizations in the sense that uh, we receive um, we, we actually build our own models, whereas most other HD agencies uh, appraise manufacturer submitted models. Another disclaimer, uh, I really like Jep's uh, slide of moving from triage to Excel to R, um, because I think that really represents a lot of my journey and that a lot of my academic training and work has been in triage and Microsoft Excel. And our training has just come as short courses, one-off lectures. Um, so my second disclaimer is that I am actually um, very early in my exposure to R as well. So key challenges. Um, and, and so these are really coming from a place of, okay, if R is the direction that we want to go, these are sort of the three key challenges that I see for building capacity in R. Uh, first is in ac the academic environment. So I've often heard, well, you know, we need this platform that allows us to easily explain the concepts of cost effectiveness analysis and can be taught with that balance with the application of those concepts and actually programming a model to use all within, you know, the three to four month time constraint of, of a particular course. And then I've also experienced and, and, and heard that, um, you know, time constraints to modify lecture material from the tree age or from the Excel to R uh, it is challenging just due to time constraints. And then I think, uh, and then moving to the, the, the right, the professional training. So, um, you know, if we have uh, a very skilled employee that is coming from the academic environment that uses triage or Excel, this is an additional skill that will need to be learned on the job. And we heard the challenges of fitting that into day-to-day -day workflow from the other speakers as well. Um, and, and I think importantly, this needs to be balanced with how often employees are going to be actually programming or reviewing models in R, uh, you know, this idea of like use it or lose it. So why invest in, in uh, quite detailed training when it may not be used for uh, very much time or as people progress in the organization, perhaps they move into more leadership and less uh, the hands-on work. So balancing those uh, demands as well. And then I think, um, Importantly, change management, this came up in prior speakers uh, talks as well, um, but you know, we're used to what we're used to. Uh, in particular at, at ICER actually, uh, we do have an organizational constraint in that the modeling platform that we use, um, it's called ICER Analytics. And we use this platform to take all of the models that are built in Excel and put them in a user-friendly platform. And this is actually, uh, the requires an Excel based linkage. And so there would be substantial um, substantial changes that would be needed to, to look into actually making that linkage to uh, an R, R platform. And so when I think about, um, you know, what's, what's the best programming language to use, uh, I automatically think about, okay, what's the goal? Uh, and I think the, the primary important goal is getting the right answer. You know, I want to be assured that whatever programming language you use, that we're actually uh, informing decision makers correctly. And then and secondly, I want to be able to show how I got there. So that transparency piece, and I want to get there efficiently. And, and, and so those are the items that I really think about in, as we think about moving to R. And then I think importantly as well is that um, we need everyone sort of speaking the same language and moving in that same direction at, at the same time. Okay, and then um, questions. I won't spend too much time on this because I think they've been uh, spoken to by, by other speakers and probably this morning you had some um, thoughts around these as well, but just thinking about quality of models, you know, as an open source language, um, want the assurance that if there are bugs that they can be updated timely um, and, and ensure that quality is maintained. 
And then uh, complexity of programming. Uh, I I tend to err on the side of, you know, let's let's try to keep it as simple as possible. Um, so is it really needed? Um, can we use Markov models for uh, Markov uh, uh, models, cohort models for most simulations? Um, or do we, do we actually need that additional layer of complexity? Then transparent, just, you know, is it, it, what are you used to? Are you used to Excel? Well, then maybe that's um, more transparent for you versus uh, moving to R. And then I think uh, lastly that just coming back to the academic environment, I think importantly making sure that that we're using a language that supports the like the foundational concepts as well of cross effectiveness analysis. And then some ideas to um, to promote the use of R. I again these have been mentioned. Um, so, you know, we really need to uh, invest in the education to support lectures, to update course materials, to to an R environment, and then in the in the professional environment, on the job training. Uh, I, I I think it's important to be tailored to organizational needs, need that support from senior leadership, and then also um, recognizing that this training may be different for somebody who will be building models in R versus appraising models in R. And so with that, I'll pass it back to Howard. Thank you very much. Thank you much, very much, Marina. And thank you much, Marish, Jep, and Mohammed for your presentations. Um, so I have some, uh, the format for this discussion is that I will direct some questions to each of the panelists, and then we'll open up to the floor to comment. Um, but for the start, uh, Barish, Janet, Jep, Mohammed, and Marina, do you have any questions for each other? If not, Marina, I will direct my first question to you, um, just because it's always my always my, fa my favorite comment about complexity and question is, is R needed because comple complex models uh, might be unnecessarily complicated. But at ICER, to what extent do you think that the lack of capacity in R and advanced modeling techniques might be driving modeling decisions? Because it might motivate programmers to choose an inappropriate model structure just because, say, a micro simulation can't be implemented in Excel very easily? Uh, that, that's a good question. I would say we're always working with, uh, we like we want to reflect the c complexity that's required. Uh, I would say that first of all, if, if it's warranted, definitely that is a direction we would go to. I don't think we've ever encountered a situation since I've been there um, for the last almost three years where the complexity that we want hasn't been allowed through through Excel as a platform. Um, I you know I, I don't know if there were other programs that were used prior to um, me joining to facilitate any more of that complexity, but we do have talent and skills on staff and with our academic collaborators that work in other programming languages such as R. Um, so I don't think that would be a concern uh, at all there. I think for us, um, it, it's also the, the ICER analytics pl platform and um, the requirements there. I think that is, that is a key a key item that we'll need to address if if R is is the direction we go. I I do have a question, Howard, for Mohammed about IT infrastructure. Um, if if that is a direction that you want to take any of the questions, um, but just curious to understand a bit more about the challenges of of that infrastructure. But happy to defer to you. <laughs> No, no, Marina, I think it, it would be very good if you could ask that question, because the limitations of ICER analytics and IT is something we haven't given enough consideration to, I think, at RHTA. So please do ask Mohammed. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, just a basic question and understanding a bit more, Mohammed, about what were the particular challenges that you faced with that infrastructure and if you found ways to overcome them. Yes, thank you, uh, Marina. Um, well, it proved to be quite difficult. Um, just to give you a brief uh, overview of how we work, we have like a two-factor um, uh, authentication to even enter our servers. So we don't work on our own personal laptops, but we have a separate company that actually organizes everyone for us and we log in and then we can work in a safe environment. And within that environment, the, the biggest problem is, is that we have personal data not necessarily names of 
citizens, but uh, dates of birth and so on and so forth, which could be traced back to personal citizens. And we have a law in the Netherlands that we are not allowed to share this type of information, and it's a very sensitive information. So within our organization, our senior management, senior leadership was very hesitant in allowing us to do something. We are not allowed to install anything. Um, uh, we even have some older versions of Excel and so on and so forth. We cannot update anything uh, just for the sake of uh, safety because they're so scared that uh, we would lose some information, personal information of citizens, which would be like a very big problem. So they are very, very strict. Eventually, uh, they we started a project uh, to make uh, the isolation of R possible. This proved to be a, 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 a process of approximately two years where we asked a separate vendor to build a separate environment that could be linked to our own environment as safe as possible. So we would work in a separate environment without uh, being close to this sensitive data. And it is called Positive Workbench. I don't know the details uh, exactly, but there might be many, many experts here that know what, it's, uh, what it is, uh, but they've built it in a separate type of, uh, uh, of server on a Linux server, or as we work on a different server. So it's the only thing we could, uh, uh, we could reach through that server is that we could reach our own documents within the safe environment. So for instance, if you receive a model from the company, we could put it in our own documents within the safe environment. And then from that, we could reach the model and run it at, uh, totally outside of all this sensitive data. And that is the, the, the clue. Uh, that they found, well, that was the most important thing. And we really had to stress the fact that we needed some type of freedom because if you cannot update or if you cannot install packages in R, you're practically nowhere. So we had to tell them to give us at least some rights outside of the, uh, the safe environment to allow us to install packages in a, in a nutshell. I'm not sure how it is with uh, with Icer, if whether you're also very strict in that in in that sense. And I'm also curious how it is at pharmaceutical companies and and, and consultancy. So maybe a question for all of you. Yeah, th thanks, Mohammed, for sharing that. Um, so it sounds like a lot of it is to do with the sensitive confidential information coming for at the at the patient level. Okay, which is a challenge, I think, because we are building our models. We do receive um, confidential information from the manufacturer, but not at um, a patient level. Thanks very much, Marie. And Mohamed. Very quick point on this, Howard, yeah, if ahead. I may. I think what Jeb shared is also important in terms of how we collaborate internally with these models, because the idea here, or the, the, the potential of R is actually a facilitate collaboration across team members rather than having one modeler, one designer, and one report writer type of very uh, distinct roles. Uh, how we set up these GitHubs, uh, how you firewall them, the data, as Mohammed mentioned, most of the time is uh, confidential data. We do not want to use uh, public sources to store those and so forth. So there's definitely a big consideration around IT, which we uh, uh, dove into as we were going through our training, but that is a uh, area that should not be overlooked. Thank you, Baris. Um, so I have one question for uh, Jeff. So um, obviously, Forexel has been very successful in building capacity in R. So my question is, is capacity already equal to Excel? Um, or how long do you think until you can achieve that? that that's a good question. Um, I, I don't think the, the short answer is I don't think that um, the capacity is equal to Excel for the moment for the simple reason that you compare a few R modelers to an extensive army of Excel or potential army of Excel modelers. So if you combine the experience, the different talent, etc., in Excel, you definitely are uh, beyond what R is. Um, how many years? Um, I, I think that the one of the acceleration factor could be the use of a large language model. It was published in the literature that uh, they start to understand maybe not the right human centric word, but at least to start in the ideal condition to help us uh, greatly into looking at code and, and trying to rebuild new version of models, adaptation, or uh, at least uh, 
similar parts of the model. So definitely, I assume it will be quick to build this capacity at equal, um, but it also depends, and I mentioned that, of the turnover. Um, if a few people leave out of the army of Excel modelers, there is a smaller impact than if a few people leave out of a, a handful of, of our programmers. Thank you. I, I, can, I can see this point between an army of Excel modelers and a few small, very good specialists in R, and that, that I think would resonate across organizations. Um, so, Mohammed, one question for you is that you mentioned that what more could be done to prove the value of R to senior staff? Um, so RHDA, Darth, and the scientific community have been working quite hard on that point. What else need, What else could we do? One of the biggest problems, currently at least in the Netherlands, is that we have very strict timelines. And currently we have a pile of dossiers that we have to go through. So if you could prove senior management that it, you would be quicker, that would be a very nice argument. Um, I mean, it's, it's just a little part of the whole uh, assessment, obviously. But we usually also calculate price discounts uh, when, when something is not cost effective. And if you also have to run a PSA, sometimes you have to wait a day or at least a couple of hours for that result. It's not the biggest issue, but proving them that it could be quicker, uh, easier, more efficient, um, that would be uh, a very good message. But also maybe to share, like all of us, I think in our presentations, we mentioned that um, uh, HA organizations should be aligned. And if we, uh, from the Dutch perspective, see that other countries also are moving towards the use of R, also are accepting models in R, that would also help uh, to move towards other software than, than, than Excel. I think, unfortunately, it's probably something we can't promise that the, the first submission would actually be more efficient and easier, um, no matter the, the level of expertise. Um, so we, we'd have one question in the chat from Josh Soboyle about um, what would the panel or why your audience consider mid-level complexity teaching materials? So I think this relates, Barish, to the, the gap you noted about the very simple models used in tutorials and courses and the reality, which is very messy, complicated models. So would you like to yeah. respond? Sure. Um, I, I still think vast major of the models we develop are not that messy or complicated, but definitely more than the uh, tutorials we have. I think the tutorials, we often use six secure uh, model uh, that has simple transitions and, and outcomes. When I think about uh, more sort of real world problems we try to solve, we often will have uh, discontinuations and what happens to those patients when they discontinue, whether they go to another therapy or best support of care and how to capture that dynamic. Uh, there are stopping criteria that we uh, often try to incorporate into the models, event-driven when they reach certain outcome, they stop, or like I think in the oncology space, progression can be a good example. Uh, we do have other than age-related mortality, other time-dependent, uh, event risks or costs, those type of small things. I don't think it's a huge uh, leap from the tutorials, but I think uh, those questions actually came up during our, our training as well. It still some, takes some time to think about what they imply in terms of the structure of the R model. So having those connections, some simple examples to say, this is the simplest version of it. If we had X, Y, and Z added to this. This is how you can think about incorporating. And uh, one of the presenters talked about best practices. I think it is probably more about those lines. I think having those middle ground tools will help us uh, create more real world like models uh, with the publicly available uh, publications or, or trainings. I hope that answers what I, I tried to mean by that. I think so. And Josh says that makes a lot of sense. Um, so I think we have time for one last question. So Rob Smith has asked, what is the preferred way for staff to learn R, whether the tutorial papers or, for example, asynchronous courses are best, or if we need all components might be necessary to actually engage? Um, so Marina, as ICER is an organization that has not yet made this transition to R, I was wondering if you could comment on that? Yeah, I, I think it's a great question. Um, since we haven't gone through it, I probably actually would even think that others like Mohammed Barish and Chet might have uh, good, good 
good comments for us to hear. But as, as I think about it, I think a mix of in person, online would be great. Um, you know, I think there's initiatives that are going on uh, with converting existing models from Excel to R. So I think if if an individual was to develop a model in Excel and want to go through the training in R, I think a great learning experience would be that um, transition from the Excel base to the R base um, and, and have them go through that process. I think that would be great. Uh, breaking things down into small steps uh, and, and aided by tutorials that are already uh, have been published. I think that's helpful. Um, and, and yeah, I think uh, especially with on the job training, I think we've already, uh, somebody has mentioned this before, but making sure it's, it's, it's balancing, it's balanced with the day to day. So having, you know, a, a mix of maybe three or four days in person go away for three to six months and come back to it um, so that you're continually applying it, but then having refreshers on a regular interval. Thanks very much, Marina. And actually we, we have time to squeeze one more question from the audience, which is about um, IT checks on packages. So they're asking, can, any, can Michael Ladon is asking, can any of the panel elaborate on what needs to be satisfied by a package, our package, for it to go through the IT check process? So, um, Mohammed, you've been highlighting issues of getting packages approved, and Jeff and Barish, you're from larger organizations that have already gone through this. So, would anyone like to comment? Maybe I, I could kick off very quickly. Um, in the guidance, at least that we've published, uh, we've recommended to use only packages that are published on CRAN. The assumption we made when we made this recommendation was that packages that are published over there went to some sort of check and are good quality and could be used, even though there might be some bugs and, and stuff all, also in there. Whereas when we talk about GitHub and other repositories, if they are there, there is maybe a bigger chance of having having something that might result in, in wrong outcomes or something like that, or even potentially other threats such as viruses or whatever. I'm not 100% sure these kind of details regarding the use of packages and the isolation of packages, but the assumption we made is that when it is published on CRAN, it's, it is supposed to be uh, all right, uh, yeah, from my point of view. Very quickly, from the industry okay. side, this is a bit, I think, more complicated. Unfortunately, HR is not big of a function by itself uh, to demand unique requirements from IT. So we happen to follow whatever the requirements are for the rest of the or bigger parts of the organizations like biostats or clinical operations and so forth, they will have their own guidelines around how they can leverage certain packages, uh, the approval process that they have to go through and HR is sort of grouped within that mix. So we ended up, if we wanted to use certain packages as trusted uh, packages internally, we have to go through this lengthy process, which I think is defeating the purpose of having a package at the first place. Uh, but that is the, uh, I think, uh, the challenge within the big pharma. Uh, you sometimes follow the process for the sake of following the process rather than what makes sense. Uh, but I, I think that question also can be quite uh, different from company to company, how they operate and what uh, type of leeways they provide to different functions. Thank you very much, Marish. And thank you very much to the audience for these questions. So um, I'd like to thank the panel, um, Marina, Jeff, Mohammed, and Barish, once again, for a really great discussion, really great to hear these different experiences and building capacity and what we need to do in the future to improve your experience. Um, so I, I know we can't give actual applause, but um, imagine 135 people applauding right now. It's quite satisfying to hear. Thank you. Okay. We will go to a very quick uh, close down for the day. So uh, thank you very much, everyone, for joining us online for the second day of the 2024 uh, R4HTA workshop. And I thought we'd just close by giving you a bit of an insight into who we are. We don't talk about ourselves, but we are the R4HTA Scientific Committee. We do have representatives from the UK, Ireland, Mexico, USA, Canada, um, and from across academia, industry regulators and consulting, including various HTA agencies. Uh, yes, we're quite UK focused, um, but um, we are increasingly international. 
We were founded by myself and Gina Bayo in 2018 with a single workshop, and we're now co-chaired, as you'll have seen, by Rob Smith from Darkbeak Analytics in Sheffield, Felicity Lamrock from Queen's University in Belfast and myself, and our treasurer to maintain links with UCL and where all our money is, uh, is Nathan Green. And as a bit of history of where we came from, so our first workshop was actually team. First one was DAL, funded by the MRC uh, Hubs for Trials Methodology Research Conduct 2 Hub. And this was followed, um, there was so supposed to be a one-off of another in-person event at UCL in 2019, where we experimented with pre-workshop training day and even tried a networking event dinner, which has not been repeated. Uh, mostly it was not repeated because COVID interfered and um, the next workshop was in October 2020, and this is the first time we moved online for a two-day event. In 2021, we repeated this with another online event, this time hosted by Trinity College in Dublin, so the first one not to be hosted by Bristol or UCL. Um, it really became international, as we had speakers then from the Netherlands, Sweden, Canada, Australia, and that was our first experience trying to balance time zones so we need to make sure we had an afternoon and a morning session so that the different halves of the world um, could actually participate. In 2022, we came back and instead of going purely in person, we went for a hybrid event um, hosted at University of Oxford. And this is also the first time we moved to a hybrid three-day structure, which we then maintained in 2023 at University of York and this year in 2024, University of Sheffield. And I presumably, um, Felicity, we will be keeping the hybrid format next year um, when we have our in-person event across the waters in Queen's University, Belfast. And Rob will be sharing a, a survey with everyone, but we wanted to show you some of the results from last year. This is the feedback from 2023, when we did ask the participants if they used R, Excel, Stata, et cetera. Um, so obviously this is a very selective sample, but we did get uh, more than 60% using R, more than 60% using Excel. Uh, the sector, we're primarily academia and consulting, so it'll be interesting to see if this got a bit broader um, this year. Um, but there was a very diverse interest in different topics, whether systematic literature reviews, R shiny, Markov, micro simulations, real world data. I think we really do cover the whole breadth of HTA in terms of our interests and also in terms of the presentations we have on. And we're hoping to get this 100% yes, we want another event next year uh, when we ask you tomorrow. So this is just priming the survey. Other than this, thank you for, once again for your attention and we will talk to you tomorrow, uh, one o'clock BST, Tuesday. Thank you very much.